underwriting deals is such a major pain point for people. Most don't want to do it, and the people that are good at it are few and far between. That is why after six years of being in the industry and buying over 1,200 apartments, using my best-selling multifamily deal analyzer, I created Real Estate Lab, a full suite acquisition software for multifamily investors. We have built a product that helps investors automate their acquisitions and close more deals all in a cloud-based platform. You can go to realestatelab.com and sign up today using the promo code TAG2 for 10% off your first 12 months. This is David Tupin. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Apartment Gurus, where twice a week, host Tate Seymour brings you deep dive interviews with the wisest gurus in the apartment investing industry. These experts are sure to create game-changing value and inspiration designed to catapult your business to the next level. Be sure to reach out to Tate at www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. And now, here is Tate Seymour and the Apartment Gurus. Welcome, everybody, back. Another episode of the Apartment Gurus is here coming at you right now you've tuned in we appreciate that and uh we've got one of the very few people that we've had on the show twice now kyle mitchell is back for his second appearance on uh what was the apartment guys podcast at the at the time and uh we're now the apartment gurus of course so i occasionally mix those up but we did change the name of the show earlier this year and uh, but it's the same show, same same me and and uh, same format where we have just really high level guests and entrepreneurs in the industry that are that are just you know doing a great job and and making a massive impact in the space. So uh, so you know to, just to introduce Kyle again. And by the way, if you want to uh, if you want to go listen to Kyle, the the first episode. Uh, with Kyle on the show, uh, you got to go all the way back to episode 21, mm-hmm. uh, which which was, uh, you know, a long time ago <laughs> and uh, for over two years at this point. Um, so so, uh, you know, Kyle's been he's he's you're a veteran at this point, Kyle, in the space. Um, I appreciate that. Thanks for having <laughs> me on. Excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Kyle is the best-selling author of Best in Class, uh, which is a book about the asset management angle on this on this industry, uh, which is so incredibly important. Uh, it's asset management is where your business plan gets implemented. It's where the rubber meets the road, and it's where the 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 value gets created and and the project. Um, so yeah, Kyle focuses on multi multifamily syndication and uh, currently has $310 million in assets under management. Uh, very, very impressive. Uh, manage, he's the managing partner of Vertical Street Ventures and the Vertical Street Ventures Multifamily Academy, where their mission is to combine high potential assets with the best in class asset management to deliver forecasted returns while making a positive impact in the community. Uh, with a background in operations and management and logistics, Kyle has overseen multi-million dollar businesses and has a passion and doing the same in the multifamily syndication space. So Kyle, welcome back, man. It's great to have you. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks. Uh, looking forward to talking to you, Tate. Yeah, and just right off the bat, I will re- highly recommend that everybody uh, checks check out Kyle on social media, LinkedIn, uh, and Facebook in particular, uh, he's a great follow, uh, posts, posts, uh, really, you know, a valuable thought provoking, insightful stuff, uh, that's, that's sure to help you out in, in your business and in your career. So, uh, so Kyle kind of catch us up, man. Um, you guys have gotten a lot done in the last couple of years since we had you on the show. Um, give us, a, give us a little catch up on how things have been going. Yeah. Well, again, thanks for having me on. Um, man, where do I start? So much really has gone on the last two years. Um, 
you know, I've, I've joined a new partnership in Vertical Street before I had my own company, which is Limitless Estates, and uh, with my partners, Jenny and Steve. And I think you interviewed Jenny not too long ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. May have been last week as well. Yeah. Um, and since joining them, we've kind of taken off and it's been an amazing journey. We've done deals in the past kind of under our separate umbrellas, but then decided to merge the two companies and uh, go at it together. And since then, which has just been since the beginning of this year, we've just grown exponentially, adding team members, adding multiple businesses, and it's it's been a lot of fun. Um, but it's also been a learning experience. You know, growing and scaling a company is not something that is easy, and it takes a lot of work and determination and learning. Um, in getting it right. So we've really been focused on that and uh, also just helping other people in the space, but also growing our portfolio and maintaining their uh, operational status through, you know, these uncertain times right now, for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, so you put, is Vertical Street new as of this year? Is, is that a new brand for you guys? Yeah, it's been around for two years, basically, okay. uh, just under a year and 10 months. Okay. Okay. And, um, it's a, it's a team, uh, Jenny, Jenny Guo and, uh, what's Steve's last name? Stephen Louie. Steve, Stephen Louie. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, you guys are, are a team now and you've, uh, you've been at it since the beginning of the year. So, you know, really just about eight months, I guess, nine months now. Um, what have you guys have you guys closed on deals what what's happened as far as as far as all of that goes yeah i mean it, it dating back to last october we've now closed on about 9 deals together wow. um, and so it's been really exponential for us because we've been able to add the right team members to our to our list right so we really complement each other's skill sets uh, we have the same motivations and passions. Uh, and because we've been able to work kind of what I call an, our unique ability, um, we've been able to scale a lot faster than than most people, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And your your, your unique ability, I would think, um, kind of kind of is a, a reference. I, I, I call it your superpower, mm -hmm. your um, what it is that you do naturally well. And it's so important listeners to know that about yourself, to know what your strength is or are, um, and to know what, where you can contribute the most on a team, uh, specifically that's doing large scale apartment syndications. So my dog's feeling enthusiastic about all that, <laughs> um, barking at somebody outside, but, um, so tell us a little bit about your team. Um, you know, how you guys work together, uh, maybe ro some roles and responsibilities that, uh, you know, that you guys have, have had set up. Yeah. So we've got a lot going on because we're very ambitious. We're a very ambitious company. And not only do we want to grow our assets under management, but we also want to grow in other ways as well. And so we also have an academy where we teach other people how to get started uh, in the Arizona markets. And then we just launched a CPA firm as well. And we have another partner on that one who's our CFO and CPA. Uh, but essentially, the way it works is that I'm in charge of underwriting acquisitions uh, and front-facing asset management. And what I mean by front-facing asset management is really the execution of the business plan. Uh, we do have a full-time construction manager in-house and a full-time asset manager. But the reason I moved to Arizona two years ago was basically to be the boots on the ground. So I'm also uh, managing our uh, team members and our property management team to execute the business plans. Mm -hmm. uh, Jenny really is back of house asset management. She's a systems and processes person. She loves that kind of stuff and she does great at it. And uh, thank goodness we have someone like that on our team. So she really helps set up the KPIs and the systems and processes on the back end uh, to manage a property management company and our business. And she also focuses a lot on driving our academy and putting together our national conference. And then Steve, uh, he's on the capital raising side. So he's great with building relationships, has ties to high net worth individuals and continues to develop those and, and meet new ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah, that's that's a nice distribution there uh, with all of you in your own lane, um, kind of doing what you do best. Are you guys syndicating? Uh, most like most of your capital stacks or 
do you also instigate or implement and use um, some uh, institutional funds? Both. Um, okay. And over the last probably nine deals that we've done together, I'd say half have a mix of um, preferred equity or family office institutional fund equity, and the other half is syndicated. Um, and then there's some deals that are fully syndicated as well. So it really depends on the deal, uh, where the market is at, if it makes sense to bring in that institutional partner, if, or if we can just do it on our own. So mm -hmm. we look at it a blend in, in multiple different ways. I think the biggest thing about the capital stack is having as many options as you can to fill it uh, and being really creative. And we look at it more as a deal by deal basis because certain deals may make more sense than others to bring in an, an institutional partner. Right. How are you um how are you kind of conceiving and nurturing those those relationships with uh, the more institutional sources? what What's been your process there? Yeah, and that's more what Steve takes care of, but I understand the process and it's it's really nurturing them by spending the time and getting to know them and understanding what what adds value to them, right? Because every person has different needs and understanding the needs behind that so that we can, look for those types of opportunities for those larger investors. And so mm -hmm. it's really understanding that. Um, and the only way to do that is spending time with them, you know, whether it's on the phone or we'll fly out and meet with them in person, um, have dinner with them and just build on that relationship so we can understand, hey, not only what are your goals today, but where are you looking in two, four, five years? Because maybe they're going to pivot and we want to know where they're going to pivot to. So maybe we can be the, the one person that helps them in their future opportunities. Or we may have to find out that this partner is no longer someone that's going to be aligned with what our future is and have to start to replace that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let, let me, I'm just going to drill down on this a little, a little more. Um, how do how do you how do you start those relationships? Uh, we you know we have it's it's been um, a lot of legwork. It's been a lot of referrals. Uh, people that you know whether it's our lender that knows of equity sources or uh, our lawyer, our attorneys actually referred us to some. But um, for you guys, uh, how 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 have those relationships gotten started? Yeah, I think you hit all three of the ways that we have on the head, except for one, we paid for them. Number okay. one, you know, we've gone to um, conferences and um, certain types of events that are very high dollar um, events that we have to pay for to get into the door to get introductions to these institutional investors. So that's mm -hmm. one way. Uh, and that also takes a long time, right? It's not like you go to the event, you meet someone and the next day they put money into your deal. That takes a long time to nurture those. Um, so everything kind of that I'm going to talk about here is something that takes, you know, sometimes years to develop and build onto, but definitely worth it. Uh, others have been referrals. So now that we're having full cycle deals, we've got five full cycle deals. Um, investors are seeing their capital back. And so we're getting referrals from those investors to other high net worth inv individuals as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really tapping into our network. Steve's got a strong network of high net worth individuals. And again, it's about building relationships. We're here for our investors. I mean, that's number one priority. And so we want to know, like, and trust our investors, just like they should know, like, and trust us. Um, and through those relationships come more referrals. Um, and then the other way is just meeting other lenders in the market, like you said, that um, work with institutional capital that can help place that um, that part of the capital stack. And that also uh, takes time to build those relationships. And so, you know, we'll send a deck out to that lender uh, or that broker, and then we'll start to have meetings with these larger preferred equity groups, institutional capital, family offices, and develop that over time. And, um, you know, the due diligence on the institutional side is pretty um, in-depth, is what I would say. And so, you know, th they don't take their investments lightly. Um, not that anyone does or should, but the due diligence process is, is very deep and in-depth. So uh, it just takes time to build those. But those are the ways that we're getting introductions to that to that capital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And listeners, you know, there's some takeaways in there if, you, if you're listening and kind of reading between the lines. Um, one of the takeaways for me is that in the course of doing business, you're going to have many, many, many conversations um, uh, with lots and lots of different people. And those are, you know, those are avenues. Those are 
uh, those are those conversations can be vehicles to getting you in front of the right people at the right time with the right deal. Uh, and, and that's super key. I mean, obviously it's, it's the only way that things get done. Uh, I'm, I'm asking you about this in detail, Kyle, because we were talking a little off air about, um, you know, a deal that we've been working on and, and, uh, we, we've been, we've been working really hard on sourcing some institutional equity, mostly through brokers, um, and, and people that are, you know, professional professionals at placing equity, uh, with, with certain projects. Um, so, you know, for us, it's, it's, there's a little bit of a, not a, I guess a bottleneck maybe, maybe is the right word. There's a little bit of a bottleneck there for us where if we could open that bottleneck up and, um, and, you know, get some of those relationships flowing, uh, it would, it would serve us really well. The complication has been, uh, for us anyway, the timing of the shifts in these, in the, in the equity and the debt market. And uh, we've we've met with numerous groups that would love to work with us, love to do a deal with us, and uh, the reality of the 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 timing of the shift in relationship to the timing of our deal, uh, it just was prohibitive for us to, you know, get that final yes and get somebody on board. So we actually had somebody on board that kind of left us at the altar, so to speak. Um, so. Yeah, I'm. Uh, it's it's good to hear. Uh, it's good to hear your perspective on what it takes to kind of get those relationships in place. And and uh, sounds like sounds like Steve's been doing a really good job for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's invaluable, just like any partner. But uh, when you have someone that um, has the background Steve does and is able to build the relationships uh, like he does, it, it it just goes a long way. And Steve's the type of person that. You know, he really wants to know about you. He wants to understand you. He wants to know you as not just a, from a business perspective, but from a personal level as well. And he spends a lot of time nurturing those relationships, but they become very fruitful because he's putting in that time. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so nine deals in the last, say, let's say 12 months, 10 months, roughly. Yep. Something like that. Um, what, what, what's the average deal look like? What, how big are they? Uh, what class, that sort of thing? Yeah, they're all over the board, to be honest, because we have our academy as well. And what we do is we partner with our students to, while they get their first deal in the Arizona market. So, you know, those are anywhere from 20 to 40 units. And then we also just closed last month on a 232 unit. Okay. Um, so th they span anywhere from 7 million all the way up to $40 million. Uh, VSV Vertical Street Ventures core bread and butter is 100 plus units, really in that 30 to 40 million dollar space right now. We're trying to get up to that 50, 60 million dollar space. Um, as we want to really start to focus on 250 plus unit deals, that's really where you get your uh, the most the best margins is what I would say from a payroll perspective and from a lot of other areas as well. Operational, so, yeah. yep, exactly. So we want to get up into that 250 unit space in both Phoenix and Tucson. And you know, 250 in Tucson is probably right there in that 50 million dollar range, but in um in Phoenix, it's more like 80 million dollars or even pushing 100 million dollars, right? So they're two yeah. different markets. Um, but yeah, they span anywhere from 22 is our smallest and 252 unit is our is our largest. On these deals, are you modeling uh, cash flow on all of them? In other words, you know, in Phoenix, when you've got such a higher price per door and you're 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 paying such a lower cap rate because the rents aren't significantly different from Tucson, let's say, um, it seems like it would be really hard uh, to find deals in a Phoenix type market that does cash flow is that what you guys are finding or how are you doing how are you handling that yeah to to be honest we have not broken into the 100 plus unit space in phoenix as easily as we have in tucson there's just more cash flow to your point in tucson than there is in phoenix right now and so yeah the cash flow especially for the first year or two while we stabilize is very very low i would say and then we get to pick it up from there as we uh increase the value Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, three, four, five years ago, even this was a cash flow market. Um, and 
about two years ago, it became a hybrid market. And now I would say it's more of an appreciation market. I do love this market in the long term, just because they're building out infrastructure. They're, uh, they're putting in policies and regulations to bring new businesses in. You know, we have 300 people moving into Phoenix every day. And so those are all, are all good stories for sure. And that's why I'm a long-term believer in what they do. But this has definitely turned into more of a appreciation market for right now. So, uh, so I guess for me, the question that, that, that begs is why invest there? In other words, if you've got a, a Tucson available to you, and I'm assuming you've got, you know, access to pretty good deal flow in both of those markets, um, why do a Phoenix market, uh, versus a Tucson market? If you, if, you know, say you got a deal on each one, why would you choose a Phoenix deal? Yeah. I mean, a couple of things here, number one, diversification, right? These are two in these are two markets in the same state, but they're very different markets. Um, so we like it for uh, for that type of a diversification. But you know, just because it's a lower cash flow market doesn't mean it's a strong doesn't mean it's not a strong market. Right. As I mentioned, I believe in the long term of Phoenix, 10, 15, 20 years because of the things they put in place over the last 10 years. Um, and so naturally, this market's going to be very hot. It's going to get a lot of eyes. It's now the number six metro in the United States as far as population. And so as you get there, what other you know markets that are in the top five are really cash flow markets? There really aren't any. They're all more appreciation markets. So it's right. a little bit different of a game. But what I tell everybody is that you can make money in any market, in any industry, anywhere in the world, you just have to understand the game you're playing, right? And so as this market has changed from a cash flow to a hybrid to more of an appreciation market, the business plan may change to make them make that investment work versus what a Tucson is, right? So mm -hmm. you just got to pivot a little bit on your business plans. But again, I'd rather be in a market that I know has set themselves up for the long-term success of the state of the city uh, then one and then move around from market to market and try and build out my teams. We mm -hmm. have a strong team in both Phoenix and Tucson, uh, including our, our core team who lives here. Um, and we believe in this market for the long term. So why not double down and go for it? Because we also have our own properties to comp ourselves off of. And, you know, you get operational efficiencies as you build your build your portfolio out here as well. So those are some of the reasons why we'll continue to invest here for the long term. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Um, you can simplify things almost a little too much sometimes and go, well, you got cash flow, you got appreciation, and yeah, there's some hybrid markets. Uh, and you know, I guess I've probably been in the stereotypical thinking pattern of we just you know, at green light, we just don't do appreciation plays, you know, because our our investors expect a, a preferred return. So um, we have to have a deal that cash flows and uh, and supports itself and pays the debt, pays the expenses, pays pays the investors. Um, so in my head, I kind of write off those appreciation markets pretty quickly, including our own, which is Salt Lake City. Um, you know, cap rates here are so compressed, and uh, and it's so expensive here that it's it, it's you know, all but impossible to cash flow. So it it's a great appreciation market um and will continue to be. And I'm a big believer in Utah like you are in in Phoenix. Um, but we just we haven't played ball here in this stadium in Utah uh for you know three a couple of years now, I guess, two, three years, uh, because of because of that dynamic. Um are you seeing anything obvious that I'm missing there? Like in my thinking, um, because it, it seems like you guys have kind of cracked the code on making it work in an appreciation market. Um, are you seeing any obvious glaring things that I'm looking over there? Well, I want to make sure I'm clear on appreciation market too. Uh, you know, when people hear appreciation, they're like, they think buy and hold and just sit on it until the market itself appreciates. But the great part about multifamily is there's forced appreciation as well. Right. right? right. And so that, compounds in a low cap rate environment. And so there's right. a lot of opportunity there if you can find the right dynamic in a property. So um, you have to pick your spots, you have to find the right opportunity. But, you know, we have a deal uh, currently that we're taking, you know, rents up 
substantially and we're able to burn off that loss to lease. Now we're putting a lot of money into the property to make it a better community and all that stuff. But at the same time, there's a huge play there because um, we found the right opportunity. So, uh, you know, I would say three, four years ago, you could have almost bought anything and it would have done well. But now mm-hmm. you've got to pick your spots a little bit more. Um, but the fact that multifamily has the forced depreciation side of it yeah. still makes this market very desirable. So w- with your investors, uh, are you guys are, are you guys like doing a like a deferred pref kind of situation while you stabilize or how do you handle that? Yep, exactly. So it accrues on the back end, right? So eventually we get there, but the first couple of years, we're not going to hit our pref. Uh, But the good news, like I said, is that accrues. So you do eventually get paid out on that. So, you know, not not all investors are going to want to hear that. Some are okay with it. Some understand it. Um, But again, if you're in a eight cap market, you're you're likely not, you're going to get the cash flow on the front end, but you're going to likely not get that back end appreciation. Right. So there's a blend. And I think there's um, certain markets or certain investors that should and shouldn't invest in in that type of environment. But I think diversification is great. So maybe you, you know, one of your investments is in a high cash flow, the other one has better upside. So there's a blend there for sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Got it. Awesome. So uh, what what's the future look like for you guys, Kyle? Are you got, I, I'm curious, are you guys are you goal oriented? Are you kind of doing a, you know, a deal by deal approach? It's, it seems to me like, you you know, with the robust nature of your, your vertical integration and, and uh, your growth, uh, you know, your aggressive growth that you've got to have some goals that are pushing you. Yeah. It's kind of funny you ask that because we're, um, our group hired a mentor and his motto is we don't do goals or we don't set goals. We set milestones, right? Because the journey never ends essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, And I love that. And so that's something that I'm taking because I am a very goal oriented person. So I'm trying to change my mindset on that, but we do have um, big aspirations and a lot of milestones as a company that we want to hit. You know, we want to eventually get our Academy to a thousand students, which is a, an extremely ambitious goal. Uh, we'd love to get to a billion assets under management, but mainly what we want is to create a culture within Vertical Street Ventures with our team members um, that everyone enjoys working with us. And we grow kind of organically and naturally as that goes. So we're really focused on, you know, hiring right now. We're bringing in seven more employees before the end of the year. And with that comes a lot of responsibilities for the ownership group to build that culture out. So that's another thing that we're really focused on. Um, and then just growing together as a team, you know, we have, um, life goals and life expectations, and then we have business goals as well. And we're really trying to integrate those two together because they really do play together. Right. So, um, as we grow, you know, Jenny has kids and a family and maybe I'm going to start a family and Steve is in a different boat. We want to make sure we're all aligned on where we all want to head in the future, along with the growth of our company. So a lot going on there, but we've got a lot of things that we're looking forward to as we kind of build our lives together. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Super exciting. Super exciting. Um, curious about, I want to ask you a little bit about your culture. Um, how, how like intentional have you guys been about developing your culture? And I'll just, I'll, I'll just share with, as a caveat, uh, you know, at Greenlight, we wrote a vivid vision for our company. Uh, and we use the book vivid vision by Cameron Harold to uh, kind of guide us in that process. And, and in your vivid vision, you're, you're basically defining your mission, your purpose, your core values, um, your team, your, your um, you know, your, even to the point of your structure, that sort of thing. And it's a three-year, viv- three-year vision. So, you know, a big part of that conversation was our culture, like what's important to us as, as a company and, and uh, what's important that, we be known for as a company uh you know how how did you guys go about uh developing your culture yeah absolutely it's a big thing in our company and jenny really has done a fantastic job in leading that charge um but what we do is we do two off-site um off-site events with our teams and we get our teams involved in what 
the vision of the company is going to be, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's not just me, Jenny, and Steve creating this vision because anyone that works for the company has to buy into that vision, mission, and values. And so we're constantly kind of evolving it and and making it better. Uh, We have also hired a mentor uh, who I mentioned earlier that is helping create that vision and looking outward towards our investors, our employees, uh, our partners, all those things to create that culture. And so it's something that is always front of mind for us. And we're putting a lot of energy and effort into it as well. And we also have a giving back uh, theme as well. We're, we're starting a, um, a nonprofit ourselves. But during that whole time, while we're, while we're getting that going, we're also giving back, uh, donating our time and our team members help in that as well. So really developing that culture is our number one priority aside from our investors. Mm-hmm. I love it. It's, it's a values focused uh, approach and, you know, knowing yourself as a company, as a culture uh, and knowing what your values are is so important because you're going to have so many decisions to make along the way and choices to make uh, people that, uh, you you know, you're going to, you're going to be so well informed when it comes time to make a tough judgment call uh, because chances are your culture or your core values or, or your mission statement, something addresses directly or indirectly that decision. And, you know, we've, we've made a few decisions about who to work with and who not to work with based on our core values, uh, you know, those sorts of things. And, uh, and man, is it nice to have a solid, solid idea of who you are and what you're about and what you're doing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you, you've got to put a lot of work and energy up front, which is kind of what we do as entrepreneurs, right? To do it the right way. But in the end, you nailed it on the head. You you now have an easier easier time making a decision about your next move because it's, does this fit our culture, mission, vision, and values? Yes. Okay, let's move forward. No then no, it's it's a very black and white situation that you've created for yourself. And so I encourage anybody or I challenge anyone to truly, truly dig into your mission, vision and values and who you are as a company, because I think a lot of people just go through that process and try and get through it as quickly as possible, but don't really live and breathe that. And that's something that Vertical Street Ventures is taking seriously. And we're evolving it even over the next six and 12 months to try and improve on that and, and really solidify that and just be like I said, very black and white on, on where we're headed and the people that we do business with and the other ones that we don't. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, it's super exciting to know you guys. Uh, you, like you said, Jenny was just on the show. Um, and I've known you for, for a couple of years now and, and followed you from, from afar, uh, social media and otherwise, um, are are you guys still doing the asset management event? I remember you guys used to do conferences uh, that were specific to asset management. Are you still yeah, doing this? No, we're now shifting. We do have our national conference, which is VSVCon in Phoenix. And it's coming up in April and we'll have an asset management portion of it. Um, but we don't just fully focus on that. So we're trying to be a little bit more broad and, and educate people on multiple subjects. VSVCon, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's located in Phoenix. And what we try and do is we get people in the seats to learn about getting started in multifamily, learn about what multifamily is, where the market's going. And then we actually hop on a bus and we'll tour all of our properties. And uh, anyone who attends gets to walk through our properties, ask about the business plan, the property management companies there to answer any questions. So it's kind of like a hands-on training piece for for that day as well. And uh, you know, you learn by doing. And I think that's what we try and promote out there and get people actually there where they can touch and feel the actual asset. And so they can ask better questions. And so, you know, it's just about getting people, just getting more knowledge out there about the syndication and apartment investing space. I think since we're in it, we feel like it's very big, but on the scope of things, it's actually very small and not a lot of people know about this asset class and the opportunities that it can give anybody, whether you're an active or passive investor. So we're mm-hmm. really trying to get the word out about it. So it's, so it, it, VSV cons really geared at, uh, I, I hate to use the word entry level, but kind of like a novice investor that's 
looking to crack into the space? Is that is that mostly the or focus? even kind of middle down the road that has been investing yeah. in a couple of years? I mean, we have some big speakers in there that come talk about the market and the economy, where it's headed and things like that. So there's education for all. But I would say that, you know, our, our core focus is probably that newer investor that's trying to understand uh, a little bit about the industry and, yeah. and maybe crack into the industry as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. Great. Last thing I want to ask you about here is, um, is the market, you know, you've got your finger on the pulse every day, all day, uh, with, with what's going on in the market. Your guys are underwriting deals. Uh, you're doing deals at a, at a high volume. Uh, you, you know, you guys are ramping up right now. And, and as we all know, the market's been shifting debt and equity, especially is, has uh, changed a lot uh, in the last six months that we're recording this in September of 2022. So uh, curious what your thoughts are. I know you don't have a crystal ball like like the rest of us, but you know, I'm curious what what your thoughts are on on where things are headed. Yeah, so I would say that I'm very happy, and I feel um, just a sense of security because Vertical Street focuses in basically one environment, right? The Arizona market. And so we don't have to to learn every other market or keep tabs on what's happening on five or six different markets and rebuilding teams. And so we're very core focused out here in Arizona. And by doing that, we have a better level of expertise, I would say. Um, and like I said before, I think the long-term outcome of, of real estate in Arizona is very fruitful and it, it's, um, it's got a lot of legs to go on it. The market has softened out here though. There's no doubt about it. Cap rates have decompressed. Rents are not being driven up like they were where they were in the, you know, 20 percentile. Um, so you're seeing a lot of that. You're seeing occupancy uh, dip down a bit. Uh, collections are softening as well. And so there's definitely things to focus on. And that's why we focus a lot on the asset management piece and driving the, the business and making sure that you're covered on that side. Long term, I love this, uh, love this market and we're going to invest here for a while. But uh, in the short term, I think you've got to make sure you're putting the right debt on it. You're executing yeah. your business plans very quickly, uh, especially if you have bridge, because you don't want to get stuck in a spot where you're forced to sell in that second or third year, however long, if you can't get that extension. Um, and really try, you know, we're trying to be vertically integrated right now because you can save on costs and you can create better efficiencies as well. So right now, our main focus is the execution of our business plan on our current assets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, um, Kyle, this has been great, man, catching up with you again. I'm going to just put you on the spot here one last time and 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 ask you what words of wisdom uh, or, or you know, kind of uh, thought bites, if you will. That's I just made that word up, I think. But um, do you have for, you know, an aspiring novice investor, let's say one of your one of your students at your academy, what's your basic message to them as they get started? Uh, if you had to, if you had to pick just one. Yeah, it's got to be committed. You know, you've got to be committed. And a lot mm -hmm. of people say they want to get started. They want to pursue financial freedom. They want to invest passively. But I know a lot of people, unfortunately, that I met five years ago when I was first getting started in the industry that are still doing the same thing, right? So commit and and take the leap and, and then move forward from there. But when you commit to something, fully commit to it and really make it a priority, and that's yeah. what I mean by committing is, is, is make this a priority. If it's something that you want to get involved in. Yeah. Be all in like burn the ships on the beach, so to speak. Yeah. Um, don't allow yourself any options or any foot out the door. Uh, just be 100% in on what you're doing here and keep surrounding yourself with, uh, you know, high quality digital mentors like podcasts and audiobooks and, and Kyle's book, best in class. Uh, you know, those, those are the things you want to, you want to keep surrounding yourself with, uh, and you want to pick people in your life that are committed to whatever they're doing, because that will wear off on you. You truly are the, the average of the five people you spend the most time with as the adage goes. And so look around at who, you know, who's, who's got your face time, right? Like who, who are you spending the most time with? And what's their level of commitment to what they're doing, whether it's real estate or something else. And, and in your real estate world, 
look at the same thing and maybe it's time to upgrade your network a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, your network's your net worth, right? So, uh, so, you know, be, I love it. Be committed. That's a, that's a, a great, great message, Kyle. Well, um, appreciate you, Kyle, very much. What's the best way for listeners to reach you and, uh, and learn more about Vertical Street? Yeah, academy. just go to our website because it's got everything from the academy to the conference and everything on there, verticalstreetventures.com. And you can even schedule a call with any of one of our team members on that site as well. That's perfect. There you go, listeners. So reach out to Kyle, reach out to his team, especially if you're in Phoenix, if you're in the Arizona market, you want to be at VSVCon no matter what, in my opinion. That's in April. So uh, you know, Kyle's got a lot of a lot of great resources to offer the academy, the book the convention. So, uh, you know, he's somebody you want to be connected with and, and know and in the industry. Um, so reach out, make an appointment by all means. So Kyle, dude, appreciate you very much. Thanks for coming on a second time here and gracing us with your presence on the apartment gurus. We're, uh, we're very excited you were here and, and got a lot out of it. Thanks for all the value. Yeah, absolutely. Honored to be on here. Thanks, Tate. You betcha. Listeners, we thank you again for listening to another episode of the Apartment Gurus podcast. We love you guys. We want you to succeed. We want you to to be happy ultimately. And and this is a vehicle for personal development and and uh and you know self-actualization, self-fulfillment, if you will, as much as it is anything else. So uh so keep it up. You're doing great things. And uh, we'll check you on the next episode of the Apartment Gurus. Take care, everybody. This has been The Apartment Gurus with Tate Seymour. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. To contact Tate, go to www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. He loves to hear from you and thanks you for being a valued listener. Just a reminder that you are the guru. See you on the next episode of The Apartment Gurus.